we will continue our discussion of um, parametric equations, and in particular, we haven't done any calculus with parametric equations. What I'm really interested in is finding and looking at derivatives. Because in my experience, using derivatives um, is the main application of parametric equations. Like in differential equations, we do examples involving the spread of diseases over time, where we use the derivatives of parametric equations. So I think that's what's really important. The textbook has other stuff like arc length of, differ of, of these things. I'll throw that on the whiteboard if we have a little time at the end. But it's less of a priority to me. So we have nope, let me not write those derivatives down. I'm uh, have differential equations on my mind. We have these parametric equations. So time is passing, and as time passes, x changes and y changes. And up to a point in terms of the derivative, there's really um, nothing special to say up to a point. We can find dx dt and we can find dy dt and there's no special equation to do that. We just take the derivatives in the usual way. So, for example, if x is p squared plus t and y is the sine of t, just kind of pulling something out of the air, then we can find dx dt in the completely usual way. Use the power rule, use the sum. And we can find dy dt also in the completely natural way. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. The important thing to be aware of is that these derivatives are not, well, they're not giving you the information, the same information that you're used to getting from derivatives. I mean, what we're used to getting from derivatives is you know, if we have a curve, you know, this maximum occurs where the derivative is zero, and this minimum occurs, again, where the derivative is zero, and the curve is increasing when the derivative is positive, and the curve is decreasing when the derivative is negative. And this 
the sort of stuff we're used to do. I mean, I say used. I acknowledge that it was Math 151. It was months ago. But the stuff we've done with derivatives in the past, I mean, clearly this can't. I mean, I keep talking about the derivative. The maximum occurs when the derivative is zero. That's not even the situation we have here, right? There is no the derivative. We have two derivatives, one for each um, variable, x and y. So the information we're getting from these derivatives, from these 2t plus 1s, let me put some kind of restriction on T. And then let's let's ask ourselves, well, what does this dx dt mean? What does this dy dt mean? And bearing in mind that derivatives are rates of change, dx dt is also a rate of change, but it's a rate of change specifically in the horizontal direction. So as time passes, we can move vertically, we can move horizontally. Most of the time, we'll be combining those two and moving both vertically and horizontally at once. So these parametric derivatives are uncoupled this vertical and horizontal movement. If we have a situation like over here on the far left, where something is moving vertically and something is moving horizontally, we think of it as a combination of horizontal movement and vertical movement. And we can ask how quickly the function is moving horizontally, and we can ask how quickly the function is moving vertically. So in the specific case where dx dt equals 2t plus 1, What information, just sort of taking a rough bird's eye point of view, what information can we get from this? Well, if nothing else, 2t plus 1 is going to be greater than 0. And I know that I know that because of where we start. We're starting at t equals zero. So 2t plus 1 is always positive. I mean, I never sometimes struggle to know if these things are obvious. Let's look at Desmos.com. Let's look at 2t plus 1. Um, okay, it doesn't like that. 2x plus 1. And sometimes this thing can be positive, and other times it can be a negative. But if we're going from 0 
to two pi. Well, all of the negative stuff down here vanished, and this can only be positive. So, this is a velocity. A positive velocity means we're moving in the positive direction as time passes, the curve or the path is sort of hard to, to say in a formal way. As time passes, we move to the right. And just as dx dt is the horizontal rate of change, we most of the time, again, if, we, if we're doing this, for example, we can think of it as a combination of horizontal and vertical change. Um, And just as in, in this previous frame, we talked about horizontal rates of change, it makes perfect sense to talk about the rate of change in the vertical direction, up and down. And probably, probably pretty intuitive that if dx dt is the horizontal rate of change, dy dt is the vertical rate of change. So this is telling us whether we're going up or whether we're going down, and it's also telling us how fast we're going up, or how fast we're going down. Looking at the specific example that I had on the whiteboard, I selected it at random, but we can run with it dy dt is the cosine of t. And here's where, here's where we see how well we remember the unit circle. When c, it, when t is between 0 and pi over 2, the cosine of t is positive, so we've got a positive rate of change, and we're going up. Between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, the cosine of t is negative. We've got a negative rate of change, so we're going down. Let me redraw that arrow so that it doesn't have a tail at the bottom. Then, between 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, the cosine of t is positive again, and we're going up once more. And this pattern is going to repeat. The curve is going to go up, then go down, then go up, then go down. So, 
putting, uh, facing my bets and hoping Desmos doesn't make a fool of me. Where do we start here? We start at x equals zero, y equals zero. Zero squared plus zero is zero. The sine of zero is zero. So we start at the origin. We're going from left to right. We are initially going up. Then we're going down. Then we're going up. So I expect this to look something like a trig function. I think this probably looks like a sine or a cosine. And I can check my work. There we are. By going to, uh, to Desmos. Let's see. And of course, I instantly forget what all the equations were. T squared plus T and the sine of T. And t is going between 0 <coughs> and 2 pi. So this is, this is what we see. My, um, I mean, my scale was off. The details were wrong. Like, I looked when I created this graph. I did ask where we started. What I should have also done in retrospect is I should have asked, okay, also, where do we wind up? But, but our shape is correct. It looks like a trig function. It's initially going up, then it's going down, and then it's going back up again. So the details aren't perfect, but we do have the shape that we expect to have. Now here's a question, and well, does anybody, I mean, here's a question I can ask. Does anybody have any questions for me before we proceed? So the question we can ask is, well, we can find dy dt, and we can find dx dt. What if we need dy dx? What if we need the standard derivative? I mean, if we have a parametric curve like that or whatever, we can still ask questions like, where does this curve reach its maximum value? And in the curve reaches its maximum value here. And according to all the stuff we did last semester, it's going to reach its maximum value when that derivative dy dx equals zero. So what if we want this derivative? And the answer is fortunately pretty uh, simple. 
that that's a word I try to avoid, but this form to the, there's a form to the for it. dy dx is the derivative of y with respect to t. divided by the derivative of x with respect to t. So, keeping on with this example, Let me dy dx is um, dy dt over dx dt. And something a little interesting, or something you should realize looking at that formula, dy dx is the derivative of y with respect to x. It's the standard derivative. But um, when we find dy dx, we don't get x's, we get t. The cosine of t over 2t plus 1. So let's ask ourselves let's, see. let's go back here and from this picture and we've confirmed it on Desmos, there ought to be a minimum and a maximum, and those minimum and maximum values ought to occur where dy dx is zero. So let's see if we can find these minimum and maximum values using dy dx, which we found, the cosine of t over 2t plus 1. Um, whether or not solving this equation is easy or hard, again, it depends on your mastery of the unit circle. Um, a fraction is equal to zero. When the top of the fraction is equal to zero. So that denominator we can actually just ignore. And the cosine of t is equal to zero. Well, the cosine of t is equal to zero an infinite number of times. But we put a restriction on t. We said that it should be between 0 and 2 pi. And there are two solutions between 0 and 2 pi. And 
Rather than sort of, I keep saying, oh, well, it's the unit circle, there's no need to be, I mean, cryptic about that. So remember that the cosine is the x-coordinate on the unit circle. And there are two values where the x-coordinate is zero. A uh, right angle, and then that angle there. And in radians, that's pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So that's where these come from. And I've gotten values of t. So I know when the curve is going to reach its maximum. And I know when the curve is going to reach its minimum, but the information I'm still lacking is what the maximum is, what the minimum is. I know when it occurs, but I don't know what they are. And I mean, that is a problem that is easily solved. If we know the maximum occurs at pi over 2, and we want to know the xy coordinates for that, well, the y is 1. The sine of pi over 2 is 1. The x coordinate is going to be some awful decimal, pi over 2 squared plus pi over 2. Um, and Desmos does uh, double as a calculator when necessary, so 4.038. And let's check 4.038 comma 1. Yep, this is indeed where the maximum of this curve occurs. <coughs> And as for the minimum, it's <coughs> the same sort of thing. We know when the minimum occurs. It occurs at 3 pi over 2. Let me say, by the way, I mean, I sort of skated through this. I knew the maximum and the minimum occur when the derivative is zero. I know there are two values where the derivative is zero, so one of them's pi over two and the other's three pi over two. Then I just looked at this picture and I said, well, reading left to right, the maximum occurs first. So the maximum is the pi over 2, the minimum occurs last, the minimum is the 3 pi over 2. We can take 3 pi over 2, and 
and we can plug it in to these equations. The sine is easy, assuming you remember the unit circle. If you don't remember the unit circle, you can always just put it into the calculator also. The x-coordinate, 3 pi over 2 plus 3 pi over 2, 26.919. And let's see. 26.919 comma negative 1. There is indeed our minimum. So this kind of analysis I mean, it's a little silly to talk about it, as if we routinely do this kind of analysis by hand. I mean, that's demonstrably not true in the, the modern era. But if you are doing this kind of analysis by hand, you see, I mean, you can find maximums, you can find minimums, but there's sort of an extra step. Um, in the sense that first you have to find when the maximum and the minimum of values occur, and then when you know when, when you found the values of t, you have to go back and plug those values of t into the equation, into the xy equations, to find where the maximum and minimums occur. And that, to me, it's early, but this is, I mean, I guess I can give the arc like form to the, it will take like 20 seconds to do. I have very little to say about it, but say that we have a curve. Going from A to B. And we want to know the length of the curve. And I sounded unenthusiastic. I mean, this is not in my opinion, a something you use commonly, but you know, it is good to have some kind of integral calculus in this section. So the arc length is an integral, and it's an integral you're basically never going to be able to find by hand. That's that's the main thing, but you take the derivatives and you square them. And you add those squares together and it's all under a square root. And the being under the square root part of things is what makes these almost impossible to take. Um, like, this is a composition, but we're never going to be able to use U substitution, basically, because there's nothing outside of the square root to be our DU. 
I mean, I guess we're adding under a square root, conceivably. We might get derivatives that allow us to do some kind of trig substitution, but I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hold my breath. Still, as we've seen, the, the obsession of calculus textbooks and calculus classes with finding integrals by hand is probably pretty misguided. If we can't find an integral by hand, there are still a bunch of things we can do. Ranging from Taylor series to the more straightforward using of the trapezoidal rule or Simpson's rule to approximate the integral. So, not being able to find an integral by hand, really not the end of the world. Keeping with this example, Let's just do it on this frame, rather than bounce back and forth. Yes, the main thing to realize here is that we're working in terms of t. So, um, t is from 0 to 2 pi. We don't want to... We don't want to get confused and say, okay, well, we're starting at zero and ending wherever we're ending, because t is our variable here, and t starts at zero and ends at two pi. Then the square root of two t plus one squared plus the cosine squared. And as I kind of predicted, I mean, I didn't pick these uh, functions to be hard to work with. I mean, the absolute opposite. Since I knew I would be doing this in front of a class, I picked things that wouldn't take too long or be very ugly. But once you put them in the arc length form to the, I don't think there's anything you can do here that's, that's likely to, to give you any, I, like I'm looking at this, I don't see how trigonometric substitution is going to work. And it certainly a U substitution don't, doesn't work. This is for, and I mean, Taylor, I wouldn't use the Taylor series. This is a learning moment. I wouldn't use the Taylor series among other reasons, because those limits of integration are pretty far away from each other. So it would, you'd have to have a lot of terms before the Taylor series was good enough to approximate both zero and two pi. And of course, that's putting aside how ugly it would be to find the Taylor series. Like, find the first derivative of this, find the second derivative of this, it would just get worse and worse. I would use uh, Simpson's rule, or the trapezoidal rule, or, I mean, more truthfully, I would use Wolfram Alpha, and then Wolfram Alpha behind the scenes would use Simpson's rule. But yeah, that's, uh, that's counter this with parametric equations. I mean, there's, there's certainly a bunch of other stuff we could do, like we haven't talked about area at all. You can find areas of regions and stuff, but, um, but I just want, I mean, with like 
basically one week remaining. I just wanted to give you a taste of this, and I'm pretty happy with the taste I've given. So we'll end this here. I will see you for our, uh, our test on sequences and series tomorrow. <coughs> If you have any questions between now and then, feel free to, to ask me.